I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. A lot of the things that I preach and a lot of things that I give to people are things that God has helped me with. There are things that God literally saved my life with. That He saved not only my soul, but He saved my life on this earth more than once. And I grew up in church. I grew up in conservative churches, going to preaching conferences and revival meetings and things like that. And I always had in my mind that the, the adults that I was looking up to in the church, they were the super Christians. They were the, they were the redeemed saints of God that never had any problems, never, never, never succumbed to the, to the ills of the world. That was, that was my fantasy land of church and how I viewed it as a young man. And as I grew older from a teenager to a young man, I kept waiting for those days to happen to me when I would become the super Christian and never have any problems, never have any, never have any failures, never, never, never give in to sin. I kept waiting for those days to show up. I kept telling myself, I'll get better one of these days. And it would get better, I, you know, I'd be doing pretty good for a little while. And then I wasn't doing so good. And it was really, really bothering me. Almost to a point to where I, I just, at one point I said, you know what? I give up. I cannot live a decent, pure, holy, unscathed by sin life. Martin Luther was in a monastery and he whipped himself and deprived himself and abused his body in an attempt to purge from his flesh all the wicked thoughts and impulses that he had. He was reading in his Bible, in the book of Romans, about the righteousness of God, and he was angry at God for making man try to live a perfect, sinless Life. That's what he thought the righteousness of God was all about. So he would, in that monastery, he would starve himself, deprive himself, cloister himself, which means he had no contact with anything in the outside world. And then he would use the flagellum, which monks do, and just beat his body, thinking that that would purge all of the evil out of his flesh. And he was angry at God because he couldn't do it. And then the light came on. And he realized that the righteousness of God was not God demanding us to live a perfect, blameless life. The righteousness of God is the imputed robe of righteousness that God gives to sinners. And it changed his life forever changed the world from what, from what God showed him he, he read that out of the book of Romans and so one day I just I had had it and I went and I wept before the Lord and I cried and I said God I can't do this I'm a failure I've failed at everything I've set my hand to I've failed as a as a worker, I've failed as a husband, I've failed as a pastor, I've failed as a Christian, I've failed as a dad, I've failed as a friend. I have, I, you, just name, you just name an area of life and I've, I've blown it. I've failed at it. When I went to Kenya a couple years ago, the, the you know, pastor and I was talking about these Africans, they think us white preachers are God's saints on earth. And they hold us in high esteem and they asked me one time, Pastor, what is the secret to your success? And I'd never even 
never even blinked an eye. I looked at them and I said, lots of failure. And they said, what? And I said, let me show you that. And I'm going to show you that tonight. You ever had those times when things were really good between you and the Lord? And you just felt like you were successful and just felt like you and the Lord. I mean, you guys were just, you were right in there. You was praying every day. You was reading your Bible. You get a chance to witness to somebody. Boy, you'd witness to somebody. You had a big smile on your face. Come in, sit down to church service. Amen, preacher. Amen. You preach on that preacher. That's good preaching, preacher. I mean, that's how it was. And you get, you get up there and you think, boy, I finally got it. I finally, I finally made it. I'm up on the mountain. I'm a never coming down off of this mountain. And that sounds good for a couple days, three days, a week. And then all of a sudden, the smile goes away. And all of a sudden now, you're just not, not up there anymore. And you were going to read your Bible, but it just, I don't know, just never, never opened up. Didn't feel like you could pray. You were defeated. Brought down. Come sit in the house of God and the preacher's preaching his guts out. I, he's like me. He's got a lot of guts to preach out. And every now and then, amen. But you weren't like that a week ago or a month ago or three days ago. I don't, I'm just assuming that's how it's been in your life because I can tell you that's how it is. We're fooling ourselves and we're fooling the world into believing that we live up on the mountain every day of our life. We're lying to ourselves, we're lying to the people around us, and we're setting a standard for people that most of the people who see us try to live that way are telling themselves, there is no way that I could be that way. And I'm not saying that we have a false, phony religion. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying to you that there are issues and things that you and I still deal with in our lives, even though we are saved, born again. And there will be defeats that come around to us that we don't want. But God brings them around in our lives, and He does so for a reason. And I'm going to try to hopefully teach you that reason tonight. The, uh, God has kind of bred this sermon in me. Every time I go out for deer season, I like to deer hunt. I like to sit out on a stand, and I like to just, if I see a deer, I'll shoot it. But most of the time, I'm just sitting out there, me and God's having a nice little talk, and I'll open up the Bible. And one year, I was sitting out, on, on a rock ledge and was looking over some low ground and over toward the, you know, just away a little bit, probably about 75 yards, there's a, there's a creek called the Big River. And it was just running down. And I sat out there and I stared at that creek just for a long time. It's, it's sort of a big creek. You go canoeing it up and down and things like that. And I just looked at that all the time. And finally, it just, it just seemed like the Lord was saying, Mike, where's that where's that river going and I and I knew what the Lord was getting at I said well it's going it's going down water runs down and he said well, how far is that going to go I said well it just gets lower all the time and God started giving me wisdom now, I'm going to show you something from the Bible tonight maybe you've read this maybe you get it maybe you don't uh, science We'll spend another million years trying to catch up with the scientific wisdom of the Bible. Amen? Right now, they're light years behind the wisdom of the Bible. God was saying that the earth was round before anybody was saying the earth was round. And God was teaching scientific principles out of the Bible before anybody ever understood them. Most scientists don't understand them now. But one of those, and I want you to look at this. In fact, let me do this. Let me put it up on the screen. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 4. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Now I want you to notice the, the process here. Here's one generation, and it passes, and then another generation comes around. Does everybody see that so far? So then he says, the sun also riseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to the place where he arose. Does everybody see that? That's what, that happens every day, doesn't it? 
Every day, the sun goes up, down, around, back up again. Happens every day. Every 24 hours, same thing every day. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his... See that word circuits there? It's a circle. The wind that blows on Elbridge, New York came out of Missouri, came out of Kansas, came out of Iowa. You guys are getting our nasty wind. But then it keeps going. It goes all the way over to Europe, down around probably the northern part of Africa, goes around the bottom of the, of the China Sea, goes up a little bit back into Canada, back down through Missouri, back through New York. Same wind that blew in this town today probably started out here, who knows, maybe a week ago or a month ago. And the wind that just left you today is going to go around again. It's going to come back around. You know, we had that phrase, what goes around. Is that true? Sure it is. And you're looking at it right here. Now watch this. Look at verse 7. All the rivers run into the sea. That's what God was trying to show me. I was watching that river. That river, the big river, ends up running into... I think it's the Merrimack River, just south of St. Louis, and the Merrimack River runs into, you've heard of this river, the Mississippi River. You've ever heard of that? We live, I mean, right next to the Mississippi River, which is kind of flooded right now. The Mississippi River goes down where? Does anybody know where it goes? Gulf of Mexico. So watch this. Look at, look at the wisdom in your Bible. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. What happens to it? What happens to the water that goes down in the Mississippi River, ends up in the Gulf of Mexico? Where does it go from there? Under the place from whence the rivers came, thither they return again. That's wise, isn't it? Isn't it just, just stop and think about the wisdom. Here's Solomon writing this. He's the wisest man ever, ever walked in shoe leather, aside from Jesus Christ, and he's writing this very profound issue down. And I want you to think about this. And then he says in verse, go look at verse 8, or excuse me, verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Now, do you believe your Bible tonight? Say amen. Look at verse 10. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It has been already of old time, which was before us. So I want you to think about that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you, God, to bless this message. Lord, I, I, know, the, I know the details of it, God, but Lord, I'm, I'm going to need your spirit, God, to let it, let it be a blessing to these people tonight. Let it be a blessing to this pastor and to his congregation and those that are visiting here tonight. Let it be a blessing to me and my, and my wife and Gary and Kay, Lord, just let it be a blessing to everybody that will watch it tonight. Lord, as, as I testify, God, of what you've done in me and through me and what you're still doing. So, Lord, just grant us wisdom, God, and help us and keep us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I want you to, th want you to think of trees. All right? In this picture, I don't know if you can see it. Here's a tree here. This, it's probably just a young tree. It's real small. And some of these are great big old things. And, and think about how the Bible refers to trees, all right? So let's get, back, let's get back to this one here that we cut in half. Right here is when this tree was a young sapling. It was about a year old. It probably wasn't but, but about that big around, all right? And it's newborn. And it's, I mean, it's wanting to live. It's wanting to grow. But everybody knows that anything that's young, and it doesn't matter if it's, a, if, it's, if it's a tree or if it's puppies or bear cubs or little fishes in the river or human beings or new Christians, 
They're full of life. They're full of energy. They don't have a lot of smarts. They don't have a lot of wisdom. And they're not very strong. And for a while, most everything in this world that is, uh, it starts anew, whether it's humans, trees, fish, kitty cats, churches, or new Christians, there is always a danger posed to them that while they are young and while they are weak, they could be taken out just about at any time. Let's get honest. I, I, listen, I, I believe right about the Bible and salvation, but let's get honest. How many people have we seen in our lifetime come into our churches, bow and make a profession of faith, last for about two or three weeks, and then buzz out and we never see them again. They'll never darken the door of a church again. Have we ever seen that before? Pastor, have you ever seen that? I've, seen, I've grown up in church. I've seen it all my life. What happens to these people? What, what is it that, that, that comes at them and, and pulls them away seemingly so easy? They don't have any root. They don't have any strength. It's, it's kind of hard to preach this in Kenya because they don't have the seasons that we have here. But I want you to think about what we learned in the book of Ecclesiastes. The water starts out in the sea and ends up back in the sea. That's the water cycle. The sun starts out in the east, first thing in the morning, ends up over in the west. We go to bed, and lo and behold, we get up the next morning, and here it comes again, the same place. That's the circuit of the sun, the Bible calls it. And what I'm going to tell you tonight is that there isn't anything in God's creation that does not have a cycle of some kind. Do you see that? If, you, if you're like me, I like to go out at night and look at the stars. The stars I see in the summertime are not the ones I see in the wintertime. The ones I see in the wintertime, by the time July comes around, they're not there anymore. Where do they go? They're someplace else. But here's what I know. Come wintertime, they're going to come back around again and I'm going to see them again. That's a cycle. Day and night is a cycle. There are birth and, and death cycles in, in just about everything. That's what he said. One generation passeth and another one come around. That's the cycle. Women have cycles in their bodies. Do they not? And if you'll, ladies, if you'll, if you'll pay attention to this and listen to this, God's going to give you more wisdom than he'll give your husband. Because you understand some things personally that he'll never understand about how these cycles work in a person's life. And I'm telling you that a born-again Christian is a new creature and a new creation. And I'm tell I promise you it goes in cycles. I had it in my mind that once I hit a level with God... It was going to stay that way. I was going to be happy all the time. I was going to be victorious all the time. I was going to win all the battles. And I, everybody would look up to me and say, Boy, we want to be like him. God showed me different. It's, Mike, it's not that way. Get used to it. So from this part here to this part here, this area represents a cycle that this tree went in. In the springtime, the rains come down, the leaves sprout, the tree draws in moisture from the ground, the leaves are getting that good sunshine in, in mid-summer, July and August, as boys soaking it all in, and it's growing. And then fall comes around, and what happens in the autumn? The leaves fall off. Now it can't take in any more sunlight. And then the ground freezes. Can't draw in any more moisture. So you know what it does? It goes dormant. And it has to wait that out. Next spring, what happens? Leaves come out. Water comes down. It starts growing again. And it thrives really good. By the way, watch this. Look at here. Look at here. Can you see this ring and this ring and this ring right here? Can you see that? There is a, there's a ring here. There's a ring right here. And then there's one right here right next to it. The space between this ring and this ring, you know what that tells me? That was a, that was a good year. 
They just had a lot of rain that year, a lot of sunshine that year. Boy, that tree just thrived and it grew. What happened the next year? The ring is only that big around. What happened? What do we know happened that year? What happened that year? It was a drought. There was almost no rain. That tree barely survived the drought. And it only grew this much. But it still grew. Because God is faithful even to trees. So then it went dormant again. And then it came back around. And look what happened. See that? There's the drought there. Why? Look what happened the next year. Well, they had revival, didn't they? And boy, they was a growing. Now watch this. Every time that tree goes through that cycle, two things happen. The roots get a little bit deeper and the trunk gets a little bit wider. You know what that means to that tree? Every time I go through that, I come out just a little bit better than I was before. And w there was a time when the winds would blow and I thought that I wasn't going to make it. We used to run through the woods when I was a kid. Remember those days? Chasing all kinds of varmints in the woods. We'd grab them little saplings and grab them right at the top and just bend them right over like that and try to break them in half. We didn't ever grab those hundred year old trees and try to do that. This is your life. If you don't believe that, let me show you what the Bible says. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a what? Tree. Now watch this. Look at this. He shall be like a tree planted by where? The rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit when? There ain't a tree in the state of New York that brings forth fruit every day of the year. So I quit expecting, number one, I quit expecting my church to be bringing in souls every Sunday. I quit expecting that out of them. I quit expecting my wife and I to be in this beautiful romance every day of the year because it's not so. I quit expecting me to be the mighty man of God every day of the week because I knew it wasn't going to be that way. And God helped me with that wisdom. God said, Mike, I'm going to make you like a tree planted by rivers of water. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to do good things to you. You will bring forth fruit. But it will be in season. We've been driving around this area the last couple days. Seeing all this corn out here. Is that, is that, is that ready to pick yet? Why not? It's not time. It's not season. It's not harvest. We don't expect that out of corn. So stop expecting it, number one, out of your church. Amen. Stop expecting it out of your wife or your husband. Stop expecting it out of your children. And stop expecting it out of yourself because it's just not going to happen that way. Am I getting through to you so far? This Bible's right. I'm telling you this Bible's right. Shall bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And I spent years of my life saying, God, that's really not for me. I can tell it's not for me. And God was saying, Mike, it is and it has been. You just, you just been looking for it every day and it hadn't been there every day. If you'll rest, Mike, and you'll settle, and you'll trust me, I promise you, I will bring forth that fruit. Let me, let me go back to something we find in, um, 
in, in what Jesus said in, in the book of John. Jesus said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and my words abide him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Now here's something that in 1990, 1995, 96, 97, here's something that I didn't know about God. I had come to believe, either it was in my own ignorance or maybe things that I'd heard in the pulpit from years gone by, I'd come to believe that God had expectations of me and when I became a pastor, I had it in my mind that God was expecting me to perform and God was expecting me to bring people in the church and God was expecting me to lead souls to Jesus Christ and God was expecting all kinds of things out of me and you know what that caused me to do? It caused me to dumb down my sermons. It caused me to want to go over to a, a dumb Bible, the NIV and it caused me to want to have a rock and roll band in my church for, for a youth rock concert thinking that I had to bring maybe, well that'll bring them in. That'll bring the kids in and boy we'll just be, we'll, I will perform for God and God took a rod after me because that's what he does to sons amen? amen and if you haven't had the rod of God across your back you're either not saved or you're a bastard and that's in the Bible amen he said that's a curse word that's exactly right and I used it exactly the way that God said but God put a rod across my back and he chastened me and God let me know Mike you read the Bible wrong I did not tell you to produce fruit. I told you that if you will abide in me, you will bear fruit. I'm the one who produces the fruit, not you. God lifted a burden off of my back that I had been carrying all of my life. And I went from one failure to another and almost just walked out on the whole thing because I had this idea that I'm the one that had to produce, I'm the one that had to perform, I'm the one that had to do it. First year I, as I became pastor at Bethel in 1996, that, that was, um, I don't know, somewhere around November of 96, and the next spring come around, you know, we had Easter service. Well, everybody comes to church on Easter service, don't they? We had, boy, I mean, we had us a time. We had like 125, 130 people in church that Sunday, and I walked through the middle of the week, and I looked at that numbers board there on the back, and I walked through that, I, I looked at that, and I saw that number, and I said, well, I guess I'm doing a pretty good job here. And I'm not kidding you, I walk, had to walk through the sanctuary to get to my office, and I walked in the sanctuary of our church, and God smote me, and He drug me down to the altar there at the front of the church, and He said, Mike, how dare you think that you're here to do this? If that's how it's going to be, I'll put you out and bring somebody else in in your place. You need to know something, son. I'm the one who brings people in this church, and I'm the one that puts them out. And however many number of people is here from Sunday to Sunday, that's the ones that I brought in. And the people that didn't show up, they didn't show up. It was my idea, and it's not yours. Stop thinking that way. And God released me from a burden of thinking that it was all my fault when people didn't show up for church. He released me from that. I like being free. God made me free that day. I look around this church tonight. I see a lot of empty chairs. Did you know that that does not bother me? I mean, I'm not joking you. It does not bother me. Because you know what I got settled a long time ago? God is always the one who is in charge of either bringing people in or putting people out. You're here tonight, aren't you? Who brought you here? God did. You say, well, Chevrolet did, actually. <laughs> God brought you here. Did you know that God could have put 16 car accidents between your house and this church tonight and kept you from being here? How many of you know that? Say amen. He could have had you come down with the flu, the measles, smallpox, Ebola. There ain't no telling what God could have done to keep you out of here tonight, but God said, I want them in the house of God tonight. Now the rest of people, I don't know where they are, I don't know why they're not here, but I believe and I trust God and I know He knows the reason. You're the ones that are here, you're the ones that are listening, God brought you into this place for a reason, and I'm happy with that, I'm settled in it. 
I don't look for the big crowds to show up. I look for the ones who listen. Okay? Now I want you to rest in that. In the book of Judges, I want to show you something. You say, well, I don't, I don't listen. I, boy, Pastor, I don't know about that cycle thing. I don't think, I don't think it's that way. Look at, take your Bible, turn to the book of Judges. Book of Judges. Verse 11, chapter 2. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods and, or the gods of the people that were around about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them to the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them and he sold them in the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And, and yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them, and turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, in obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. When the Lord raised them up, judges, then the Lord was with the judge, and, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted. You see that word return? They went right back down into it. And here's what he's saying. He said, they'd be up here. God sent them a judge. God to lead them into righteousness. Boy, they're doing good. The crops come in because they're worshiping God. Crops come in. The family's doing good. Cattle's being born all over the place. And boy, it's good. But here's what happens. When things are going good, you and I get so full of pride that we stink in God's eyes. So what he does, he'll allow the enemies, he'll allow the oppressors to come in. And that God will use them to persecute us and chastise us and bring us down so that when we're down there and we're sick of it, we'll cry out unto God. God will send the Savior once again, bring us back out, and there we are right back again. From what I could count, 15 times in the book of Judges, they went this way. Over and over. You read Judges. You go home tonight and you read the book of Judges and you see if this is not so. Now I'm going to show you something that God helped me with. Let me teach you something. I, I know your pastor believes this. He and I talked. I always try to check out my ideas against other men of God that I trust. You're saved. You've got the seal of the Holy Spirit in you. You've got the living word of God breathing on the inside of you. And your promise and your eternal hope is in heaven. The mistake that you'll make is in thinking that you will reach a pinnacle of your life where you will never sin nor fail God again. That is a mistake that you'll make. I made it. I told you, I grew up in fundamental churches watching fundamental people thinking they never did any wrong. It wasn't until I grew up and started hearing other people in town talk about the people that I was looking up to, the number of affairs that they had, the number of drunkards there actually was. I lived in a fantasy world where everybody was perfect and nobody ever did anything wrong. And that was the standard that I set myself up for. And really what I was doing, the devil was setting me up for a big fall. So I began to search the scriptures for answers. In Judges chapter 3. Here's what God said. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hand of Chushan, Rish, and Tham, king of Mesopotamia. The children of Israel served Chushan, Rish, and Tham eight years. When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. 
The land had rest 40 years. And what I'm going to just cycle through these verses. But over and over. Judges 3, Judges 4. They went up. They went back down. They went up. They went back down. They went up and they went back down. Over and over and over again. I told you to turn to, what did I tell you? Judges 3. I want you to look at Judges 3 verse 1. You remember when God told Joshua, he said, Now Joshua, when you go into that promised land, I want you to slay, kill, destroy every man, woman, child, everything in that land. I want them all dead. You remember God said that? Did Joshua do that? No. Most of it. But you and I both know that leaving just a little bit left over causes us big problems later down the road. Can I hear you say amen? A little leaven does what? So they left some of those guys in that land. Now I'm going to show you from the Bible God's plan of why He let that happen. Verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left. Who left them there? The Lord did. To prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel has had not known all the wars of Canaan. In World War II, we had in this nation some of the greatest Americans that has ever seen the light of day in this country. Our young boys, 17, 18, 19 years old, most of them volunteered. We had a man in our church that was a World War II sub submarine guy in the Pacific Islands. 17 years old, he heard about Pearl Harbor. He lied about his age. He said, how dare they do that to my nation? And he went and fought a war over there and survived it. I don't think we have enough young people in America right now to fight a war like that and win. You know why? We've gotten soft, haven't we? We forgot how to fight. We don't know how to defend ourselves. We don't know how to protect ourselves. We, don't, we think that's somebody else's job to do it for us. And so we let it go. And you watch this. You, lo you look at what God said. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at, at, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. God said, I left them in that land to teach that young... Joshua and his generation knew how to fight, didn't they? His children come along as the baby boomer recipients of the peace that Joshua and his companions had won with their blood and guts. Just like in America. You and I are living in the, in the freedom that our grandfathers and our uncles bought and paid for with their blood and guts in Germany and in Japan. Amen? But my generation and younger is soft we don't know how to fight. We don't even know if anything's worth fighting for anymore. That's what the devil's done to this nation. So watch this. This is you. When God saved you, could God have removed all of your sin, your impulses, your urges, your temptations? Could God have removed them all? But he didn't, did he? Why? He's teaching you how to fight. He didn't leave them all there. Else you would have been overcome a long time ago. God left just enough in there to teach you how to fight. You'll have to ask the Holy Spirit if what I'm saying to you is true. That's what he did. That's exactly what God said here. I left just enough in there to show your boys how to fight and protect their own land. Because you guys are dying and going off the scene. And these guys don't know how to fight. You know what David said? Lord, teach my hands how to fight. Teach my fingers to know war. And so every battle, every time temptation comes along in your life, every time you fall into some stupid sin that you said, I'll never do that again. Every time that happens, you know what God's doing? He's making you a little bit stronger, rooting you a little bit deeper, and He's making you stand taller than you stood last year. 
Does that make sense to everybody? So let's go forward with this. Let me show you the, let me show you the water cycle from the Bible. And I'm going to show you just how right this thing is. So he said, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, there do they return again. So watch this. This is how it works. This is what it looks like. Here's all the water here. It's in the Gulf of Mexico. This is, this is how we see it in Missouri. All, that, all those storms and all that humidity we have in July and August, every bit of that comes from the Gulf of Mexico. Okay? So all of our weather patterns come up from there. So here's the Gulf of Mexico for us. And the moisture is picked up from the Gulf, brought up into the upper atmosphere. It's condensed in the clouds. We get rain and thunderstorms and tornadoes every now and then, just dropping buckets of rain everywhere. We've got gullies, we just like around here, we got gullies and streams and dry creeks that, boy, they get full fast when the rain's coming down. And they run into the little creeks, which run into the smaller rivers, the big river, the Merrimack River in our area. St. Francis River, all of those rivers run into the, the mighty Mississippi River. Some of them go into the Missouri River, which feeds into the Mississippi above St. Louis. And then the Mississippi River runs down. The Ohio comes down here south of, of Illinois and so on. And it runs all the way down until it hits the Gulf of Mexico. And there it is, right back where it started again. So I'm going to show you the typology in your Bible of how this is your life. I, I, I want to ask you tonight... Do you, those of you who are members and come to Calvary Bible Baptist Church, do you have a heart, number one, for the mission work of Jesus Christ in your community? I'm, I'm just asking you that. You answer that on your own. Do you have a heart and a soul and a, and a purpose in your mind that, Lord, I would like to be a blessing to somebody besides myself? Lord, if there's any way that you can use a worthless, dirty, filthy, nasty, hell-deserving sinner. God, if there's any way in the world that you can use somebody as awful as me, God, I would find, I would find a lot of fulfillment. I would, I would just be blessed if you could just produce some fruit in me that would be a blessing to somebody else. Let's make it personal. Ladies, maybe you'd pray, Lord, I really don't want to be a mean, bad, angry wife. Lord, I'd like to be a blessing to my husband. Lord, I'd like to be a blessing to my children. I'd like to be a blessing to my grandchildren. Maybe some of you husbands would say, God, Jesus gave himself for his church. Lord, I'd like to be able to give myself for my wife and be a blessing to her. That is not possible every day of the year. It will come in seasons. It will go in cycles. And I'm going to show you how this works. First, it starts out in the sea. In the Bible, the sea is always referred to as the deep. There's no deeper place on planet Earth than in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, doesn't matter where you go. There's no deeper place on planet Earth than the bottom of the ocean. So watch this. Here, here's, a, here's a person who needs to be saved. They're lost and they're dead in trespasses and sins and they need to be saved. Where do we put dead people, by the way? Down low. That's where they start out. So watch what the Bible says. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from where? Where did he say he's going to bring them from? By the way, he said he'd do it again. From the depths of the sea. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. That's, that's us when we're lost. That's us when we fall back into that stupid stuff that we said we'd never do, thoughts we'd never think anymore, things we'd never say anymore. That's us. Remember Jonah? Where was he? He said, I prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heardest my voice for thou hast cast me into the deep. 
In the midst of the seas, and the floods come past me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look where? Again, toward thy holy temple. He keeps using that word again. I'll look again to the holy temple. I know I'm down low. I know it just seems like the world's crashing down in on me. I know that's just the enemy's just walking all over me. But I'm going to look again toward God's holy temple because that's where I want to be. So you're down in the deep. So all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Why? What happens? And to the place from whence the rivers come, there they return again. So now you're down, you're down low in the depths of the sea. So what are the things that brings water out of the sea? Two things. Sun and wind. The sun is Christ Jesus. He is the Son of Righteousness who arises with healing in His wings. And then the wind picks up that, that uh, evaporated water. The wind is the Spirit of God and it is the Word of God. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What did Jesus do with His disciples? He went, receive ye the Holy Spirit. So watch this. Here's what happens. Some old sinner comes in the back door of the church there. Pastor George, he's preaching the old time way. He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching, hey sinner, you can be saved. He's preaching the words that are in this book. And the sun is lighting this man's sins and shining into the deep dark places of his heart. And the wind of the word of God and the spirit of God is breathing into him. And all of a sudden he rises up out of that pew. And he says, I want to be saved. Somebody say amen. Listen, I'll end up preaching better than you'll amen me tonight. I promise you. This saved my life one day. I promise you it saved my life. So here's the sun and here's the wind. It's going to pick the old sinner up out of the deep ocean. Malachi chapter 4. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So there's the sun shining over the water. And that water is going up into the air. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, God speaks in the whirlwind. Have you ever seen that? Do you know what, do you know what that is? That is the sun and the wind heating up the water, bringing it up out of the ocean, bringing it up to the clouds. That's what happened. Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember when Jesus first spoke to your heart and cleansed an old nasty sinner and you come up out of the grave and boy, you was just walking around on cloud nine. Amen. Oh, let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, let me tell you what Christ has done. How many of you remember those days? You were ignorant, but you were full of bliss. Amen. That, used to, that was you at one time. kind of came back down from there, didn't you? So watch this. Remember what happened on the day of Pentecost? What did they hear? The wind was blowing, picking sinners up out of the ocean. Once water is picked up by the wind and the sun, they gather together in the clouds. I want you to think about clouds. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know what the clouds are? It's the assembling of the water droplets that are in the atmosphere and they're coming to, they're, they're condensing into one place. That's why you see clouds. We went to Niagara Falls this morning and we got soaked three minutes after we got out of the car. That water, that, I mean the mist was coming up that and it was, I mean there wasn't a cloud over us but it was just constantly raining down on top of us. So watch this. I'm telling you, the fr you listen to me and you listen to me real good. When you are in this upward cycle, the first and primary thing in your heart is to condense with the other clouds and be in the house of God and not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Bless God, I'm saved. Oh, I know I need to start going to church now. And all of a sudden you start going to church. You're down there with the other sinners. Oh yeah, he's saved. So that's what happens. God starts bringing all the water droplets together. Now they're together. 
So there they are. The beautiful lofty clouds that the glory of God is shining through. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation, the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared where? Listen, there ain't nothing in the world like a church service where God's people are gathered together, and it doesn't matter if it's five or five hundred people, where the glory of God is coming down in that place. Amen. There ain't nothing like it in the world. That's what God promises. So the glory of the Lord appears in the cloud. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness around about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Boy, it's all sounding good. Oh, the Son of Man, He's coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Amen. That means, He said, where two or more of you gather together my name, there am I in the midst of you. He's coming in the clouds. That's this church. I'm telling you, I'm going to preach this way better than you're going to amen me. <laughs> Hebrews 12 says that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of what? Witnesses. Let me tell you what Jesus did in my heart. Let me tell you what Jesus did in my heart. That's a cloud of witnesses. Churches ought to be full of them. Amen? So you get saved, God pulls you up out of the deep, He puts you in the clouds with all them other believers. And boy, it's good, isn't it? We have the preaching meetings, we have revival meetings, we're all getting together, shaking one another's hands, singing the old songs. Boy, we're doing it good. Here's what happens. Clouds are lofty. Here's what happens with every church, every denomination, every preacher, every church member, every Christian. It happens over and over and over again. Well, bless God, we believe the King James Bible. What's the matter with the rest of you idiots? How come you don't believe the Bible? How come, you wear, how come you wear that stuff around town? How come you listen to Willie Nelson all the time? Well, bless God, we don't do that. I've been in fundamental churches all my life. I've heard it. I've seen it. Clouds get lofty. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and what? Lofty. And upon everyone that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Do you know what God says? God says to a man of God, or God says to a church, or God says to, God says to a marriage. God says to a Christian home, you're so stuck on yourself and all your homeschool meetings, and I'm, I'm for homeschool. You get so stuck on yourself and your dress codes and everything else that you don't care about anybody else. You think that everybody ought to come up to your standard all the time and you look mean at everybody and you are mean to everybody and I cannot use you. Not while you're full of pride. So what's God going to do? For he bringeth them down that dwell on high. The lofty city he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. So what's God going to do with you? Has God done that with his church in the past? If you're serving God, he has. He's done it at my church. He's done it to me. I, can't, I cannot tell you the number of times God's brought me through this cycle. By the way, have you ever seen the planets go around the sun? Some of them go fast, don't they? Some of them it takes forever to go around. Did you know that not everybody is the same in these cycles? Some people... It just seems like they're constantly in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Well, bless God, they're in and out, in and out, in and out, instead of out. 
And those of you who are looking down your long nose at the people that you see around you coming in and out, in and out, and in and out. The truth of it is, you're on your way out. You're just going so slow you can't see it. Have I said anything so far that's not right according to this Bible? He's going to bring you down. Jude said, these are spots on your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Look what they are. They are clouds without what? The worst thing in the world to a farmer is to see a cloud come over the land and leave his field dry. He curses that cloud. You fake! You phony! And you listen to me. Your neighbors and your lost family members think that you're a joke. Because you pretend that you're up here all the time looking down on them and everybody else. You think, listen, I'm only telling you what God has had to drive into my heart. 18 years old, my daddy worked his guts out to have enough money to send me to Bible college. My dad at the time was lost. And the day before I left for college, we, I had an accident in my dad's car. He's given me his car. And I was pulling out of the driveway and, and bent the fender, plumbed to pieces. And I'm telling you what, stuff come out of my dad that I'd never heard before. You know what he did? My dad drank, it was a brand of St. Louis beer called 905 Beer. My dad, in the heat of all of that stuff that was going on, he pointed his finger at me and he said, You despise me because I drank beer. And I went. He was right. I was Mr. Fundamentalist Preacher Boy going to the Bible college, going to save the world. And I despised my own father. My dad's dead now. I can't make all that go away. So the worst thing that you can be is a cloud up here that's no good to everything that's down here. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. You didn't know the Bible had all this to say, did you? Listen, God's wise. God had you figured out long before you came on the scene. So what happens? You were up here, weren't you? Which way are you going now, big boy? You know how it works? Watch this. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herb and the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. And I'm telling you with everything I got in me. This lost world is sick and tired of cocky, arrogant, bullheaded Christians that are no good to them. And where they live. They don't live up here with you. They live way down here. Remember, they're at the bottom of the sea. They're in the deserts where they need rain. And you're sitting up there lofty and bless God. I don't suck them cigarettes no more. I don't put up with that. All God wants to do is bring you down because when, when He sends you down, He's sending you back with doctrine and preaching and the Word of God so you can bring a, a stream into a parched desert of somebody's life. I want you to think about your marriage. I want you to think, listen to me. I want you to think about how your kids see you. Those kids 
that as of now will not darken the door of another church. Because they saw the phony, baloney, lofty Christianity. And they said, I'll, I know those people and I knew their lives and I knew they were lying through their teeth. So here's what God does. Their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a what? You know how you can tell God's ready to start working in you? Raindrops will start flowing. You'll start weeping. You'll start weeping over the people you offended. You'll start crying over people that you look down on. That's when God's going to start using you. The tears run down like a river day and night. Give, give thyself no rest. Let that not the apple of thine eye cease. They that sow in what? Tears. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of the people of Israel that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon the land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. I don't know how to fix America. We thought back a long time ago that if we joined up with the moral majority and Jerry Falwell that we could take this country back over for the Bible and the Ten Commandments. We thought that that was going to work. And the lost world, all they did was despise us for being too arrogant. Because we put off to the lost world that we were better than everybody else. And the truth of it is, we're not. And I know we're not. So maybe, rather than this lost world seeing how high and mighty we act, maybe it'd be good for them to see us coming back down to reality every now and then. Who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth water upon the fields? Who does that? Who gives rain upon the earth and sends water to the fields? Who does that? Now I want you to think about how deep this really is. I want you to remember, here not too long ago, you said the stupidest thing Something that you said you'd never say. Words that you said you'd never say. Jokes you said you'd never tell. Music you said you'd never listen to again. Things you said you'd never look at. Things you said you'd never do. And you did them. And you said, oh God, I failed. God, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me. God, I want to be right. Who brought you back down? God did. How did he do it? How did he bring Israel in the book of Judges from their lofty position? He's let the Philistines come in. Philistines got cruel authority over them and brought them down. Because God knew that every time they came down, they was going to cry to God to be brought back up again. Who did we say left some of the Canaanites in Canaan land. Who did we say left them in there? God did. Why? To teach you. So that winter time would come and you weren't doing very well. So that you would have enough. Isn't that something that we get in the heat of summer and we start fanning ourselves and we're going, Oh, Lord God, I wish you'd cool off around here. And then come December, January, February, you got you guys out here close to the lakes, you got 25, 30 inches of snow laying everywhere. It's 30 below zero. And you're going, oh Lord, I wish you'd heat this world up. It's cold. We support global warming. <laughs> and you know what he's doing in the wintertime of your life? He's forcing you to cry out for springtime revival. 
You show me a church that has a revival when they don't need it, and I'll show you a church that didn't have revival. They had services like we always do. They brought the hot rod preacher in. He preached three points in a poem and sent everybody home. Had a big altar call. Oh, yes, bless God, boy, it was good. There was no revival in that church. There was nobody changed lives. There was no hearts different. There was no birthing taking place. It was just a show. I'm telling you, I've been in fundamental churches all my life. So he brings us down with tears. This is what God was showing me that one day. He said, Mike, see that water? Yeah. Where is it going? Down. And I said, it's going to keep getting lower all the time. So where does it go? Watch this. Watch this. There's a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the holy city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Where did that river come from? It came from our tears. It came from God bringing us down out of the clouds. That's where it came from. Now, now we can do some people some good, can't we? Now we are a fresh cold drink of water to some thirsty people in Elbridge and Auburn and the places around us. Now we're going to do some good. Then the lame shall, man shall leap as in heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. In the wilderness shall break out, water shall break out and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool. And the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reed. By the way, Dragons love where there ain't no water. You start sending streams of water through there, them dragons will leave. Amen. And the highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. God wants to save some sinners. But he's got to bring you down to do it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I, I'm, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to show you. Let's go back. I'm not going to preach all the rest of this, but I'm going to show you. Let's do this one more time. This is where you were. This is where you went. This is where you got no good. This is where God brought you down. And now you're a blessing to everybody around you. And now you're back down here again. And so what do, you, what do you do every time you get down here? What do you do? God, bring me up out of this, please. And so God says, <sighs> There you are again. I don't know how to close this out. If you study the Beatitudes... Matthew chapter 5, you'll see the cycles. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is a lost man who's bankrupt before God. That's where it starts out. You're bankrupt. You cannot pay the sin debt that you accrued in your life. And then you start looking at that. God, through that beatitude, starts bringing you up and using you. Now you're a peacemaker. You know what a peacemaker is? You go around telling lost family members, let me tell you, you know what kind of sin, you know what kind of drunk I was, you know what kind of slut I was, you know what kind of person I was. I want to tell you something, I found peace with God. I would like for you to know peace between, between you and God. That's a peacemaker. You know what, how it ends up? Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You know what happens? Every time we get too high, God will let persecution come in and bring us back down. But you know what the word blessed means? You're saved. He's blessing you while he's making you like that tree planted by rivers of living water whose fruit will be brought forth in his season. So I, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to ask you to bow your head tonight. And... I'll just ask you, we, we don't have to sing a song. I'm not, I, I'll just be honest with you, I'm not big on, on having a big, I, I don't have, we do it every now and then. 
But I think if God's going to move, he's going to move. So I'm going to ask you tonight, if you'd just think about what I said, think about what God showed you tonight. So there may be different types of people here. Maybe you have, maybe you are down in the ocean right now. And you think that it's over. You think, that's it, I've, I've messed up too much. I can't, God's, God's cast me out. I can't do it. There's no hope for me. I'm here to tell you that God is the one who put you there. And that God is the one who's going to bring you out. Maybe you're here tonight and running through your mind is a list of people who know you, who hate your guts because in your arrogance, you offended them and they said, I'll never come to your church ever again. And you realize that you have been so arrogant and prideful and cocky with everybody around you and you're a cloud without water they don't look to you for hope anymore you done fool them too many times and you'd say God I want to become a river again I want my family members saved I want my children saved my grandchildren saved I want my church to have revival So again tonight, without, without singing a song, I'm just going to ask you if you would, if God's dealing with your heart, just come down here tonight, lay it all out before the Lord. He already knows about it, so you're not, you're not gonna, it's not brand new to Him. Maybe you'd just like to come and let God start the watering process. Maybe, maybe some of you need to be lifted up. And you would just like to step out and come down here and let's pray. I'm going to start. If God's dealing with your heart, why don't you come?